Hello, my name is Peter Tchaikovsky, and I am the creator of the Story Engine deck, which is a deck of endless storytelling prompts, and of the Deck of Worlds. And today I want to show you the Lore Fragments expansion for Deck of Worlds, Fresh Ink and Ancient Song, and it's full of prompts for creating in-world lore. Text, documents, songs, art, performances, things that really come out of the world that you created, that feel organic to that world, and that help anchor it and make it feel real. Hi, this is Peter in the edit booth later, letting you know that in addition to the Lore Fragments expansion for Deck of Worlds, which is specifically designed to create in-world documents and types of lore, we're also working on a full standalone deck of lore prompts, which you can use to create intricate webs of lore that link together your characters, your factions, your world history and events, locations, objects, species, material resources, value systems, and more. You can learn more about that at storyenginedeck.com slash lore. But let's go back to talking about the Lore Fragments expansion. One of the reasons that I am so passionate about Lore Fragments and adding lore is that I think they're one of the most undervalued tools in both world building and also in storytelling. When I, as a reader or a role player, have a chance to experience some really well-built lore, whether it's hearing an ancient riddle or getting to learn a tavern song or seeing a sketch of the statue in the town square or the plaque with the story behind it, I just love those moments because they create absolute synchronicity between me, the reader, and the character that I'm reading about. I am getting the exact same level of access to that, to that lore, to that document, to that text as the character is. For a minute, we are experiencing the world in the exact same way on the exact same level, and I'm, I'm in their head, and I just love being able to get that close to story, that close to a fictional world that I can't otherwise visit. It's almost like having a little a little portal through where you can access it on a deeper level, and that's, that's real magic. So that's why the Lore Fragments expansion is one of my favorite expansions and why I put a lot of thought and effort into how to make sure that these prompts are going to be effective and interesting. Now, the Lore Fragments expansion comes with a little guide booklet that explains everything that I'm going to tell you now. So all of this will be on hand. And there are basically three different ways that you can deploy the Lore Fragments expansion in your world building, depending on your goals and your style of world building. First way that you can use it is to draw these cards as you are creating each micro setting. That's not what we're going to do today, because what I'm actually gonna do is build on a micro setting that I've been creating through this series of demo videos. But if I had wanted to, when I was first creating the first micro setting, I could have stopped right then and there while the juices were flowing, while the iron was hot, and I could have drawn cards to come up with a lore prompt and created lore in that moment, or just left myself notes about what I wanted to do with the lore. The advantage to this option, which is drawing cards and creating lore as you create each micro setting, is that you get to take advantage of the fact that like all of your neurons are already firing, you're already in the mode of thinking about this particular setting and what makes it unique and interesting, and you can use all of that momentum in creating your lore. The second option is what we are going to demo today, drawing your lore fragment prompt at the end of creating your entire setting. So whether you're going to create just a few micro settings that are connected or you're building a giant world map, you at the very end start to draw cards and apply them to different settings. The reason that I like doing this and the reason that I've chosen to do this today is that it gives me the greatest amount of choice in how I want to pair the prompt with my world. By that I mean I can look at the cards and I can think about the type of lore fragment or the medium that it's going to exist in and really think like where in the world would that fit? Where would that make the most sense? Or where's the richest material that I can draw from in my existing prompts to really make this prompt shine and feel connected? I really like having that experience. I like being able to sort of survey my terrain and figure out, oh, that's, that should go there. Um, and that's why I've chosen to do that today. I also wanted a chance to keep building on the same micro setting to show you how each expansion adds new layers and new insights to how that setting works. The last way that you can use this expansion and pretty much any of the creative expansions is you can use them as flashcards. Even if you don't own the deck of worlds, even if the only thing you own is that one expansion, you can still pull these prompts to come up with ideas for lore for a setting that you've already created. Maybe you've been working on an RPG setting for the last five years and you just want a chance to put some really interesting documents or historical historical pieces in it, this is a great way to do that. Let's imagine that the world of your work in progress novel needs a little bit of fleshing out or you want ideas for little bits of text to add as epigraphs for each chapter as you dribble and drabble out these little bits of world lore. This can be a great way to come up with ideas for those. So they can be very, very useful just as flashcards as well. Today we are going to build on the setting that I have been getting to know better and better, and that is the Camp of Ghosts and Rogue island. So I'm going to give you a very quick summary of what these settings are, and of course I will include chapter notes and timestamps in the description so that if you've already heard me explain this setting you can just skip ahead to the part where we start building on it. Camp of Ghosts is a camp of retired heroes who have basically faded 
from public life and decided that they're not going to be heroes anymore. They've resigned their responsibilities to the realm and they just want to live out their autumn years in peace. They have located this camp at the top of a set of dangerous cliffs because they really don't want to take visitors. However, there are lots of new, upcoming, fledgling Greenhorn heroes who really, really want a chance to visit these retired heroes and learn from them. They want to learn their combat style, they want to learn the secrets to how these people survived long enough to retire when so many heroes die in a blaze of glory or suffer a grisly death. And in fact, a new commune of Greenhorn heroes has set themselves up at the base of the cliffs, and these are people who are encouraging each other to pursue their dreams as heroes, and every now and then one of them builds up the courage to try and scale the cliff. I should mention here that the entire our cliff face is inhabited by a species of very territorial mountain goat that is constantly trying to headbutt climbers off of the cliffs. And there's also, I decided previously, some kind of apex predator that lives on the side of the cliff and eats the uh, goats. And I've just had a brainwave uh, that rather than that being some kind of, I was thinking of a snow leopard and then I was thinking of this since it's a coastal area being like maybe some kind of seaside or coastal leopard. But now I think it's going to be one of those um, giant coastal iguanas, those marine iguanas that are always like crusted in salt um, and that have really interesting adaptations to all of the salt in the water that they drink. I think a giant carnivorous hunting type cliff iguana that lives off of these goats or rams would be a really interesting addition to this space. So that's that's now canon. You heard it here, folks. Just offshore of the Camp of Ghosts and off of this Camp of Fledgling Heroes, there is Rogue Island. Now, Rogue Island was a academy of rogues, thieves, deceivers, and liars, and fraudsters that used to be located elsewhere and then relocated here because they wanted to recruit disillusioned young heroes who found that they couldn't get the mentorship that they wanted from the Camp of Ghosts. And there are a few details that we've already set up for how Rogue Island works. Number one, Rogue Island is actually the location of, or perhaps even made from, um, a currently dormant volcano called the Volcano That Sleeps. It runs on a barter system that is actually largely based around gambling, not just bartering, but there's always some kind of bet or wager or play or attempt to manipulate the other person that comes about in the way that they do any kind of business. There's a very elaborate etiquette system that's based on the honor of thieves, and that elaborate etiquette system is basically that anything that you can justify using the thieves' code is fair game. And so part of what they do is just try to make convincing arguments for how they are interpreting and applying that code. A lot of the students who come to Rogue Island were attracted because of the promises made by its founder. Its founder claims that they had created a series of hoaxes by which they built up this amazing reputation as an adventurer. So their claim was that they had managed to convince the entire world that they had done these amazing, amazing legendary feats, like defeating monsters and seducing heads of state, and that they would teach you how you could tell lies that are equally implausible and make them convincing. However, very recently, that founder was found out to have been lying about the hoax. And by that I mean, people discovered that they actually did the amazing and legendary things that they claimed to have done. So in fact, they were a fraud by being honest, which I think is a really fun twist. And in fact, I am now just realizing as I say this out loud again, that it'd be really interesting if the founder was in fact someone who unretired from the Camp of Ghosts. And that could even explain why they located this academy um, or this rogue island right next to Camp of Ghosts. It's because they, they know about it, they've already lived there, they've been very close, and maybe they just kind of got bored of the retired life and they found out that this community of people who were honest with each other and starting to talk about some of the things they've experienced wasn't quite their speed. So to create your lore fragment, you're going to be drawing two different types of cards, the first of which is the Opus card. Each Opus card comes with four cues, and these cues describe the format or the medium that you're going to be creating your lore fragment in. This is what's going to tell you if you're going to be creating a drinking song or writing down, say, a local prayer or a bylaw. Maybe you will be sketching a local statue or a tavern or restaurant sign. Heck, maybe you'll be doing a um, page of a local field guide to plants. There's a huge variety. Something that you'll find is that every single Opus card comes with at least two entirely writing-focused cues. There's always one cue that can be used for visual art or for writing as like a description of it. And there's always going to be a cue that can be done as a performance, whether it's a song or narration or a piece of a play, or that can be done again through description or through writing a script for it. So there's always a variety of ways to tackle each thing, and there's always four options for writers, one option for artists, and one option for performers. And this is just to give people a lot of different creative options for addressing the variety of ways that text and storytelling can exist in a fictional world. And then the second type of card that you draw to create a prompt is the Flourish card. Flourish cards are optional stylistic options for creating a, a more specific kind of lore fragment. 
And that's because, again, lore fragments don't just arise out of the world. Usually at some point, somebody thought of it. Somebody carved it or designed it or wrote it down or sang it. And so this just gives you a little bit of the style that that person might have been creating in. And it also helps really make these prompts feel organic and specific to your world and the people in it. It really, really anchors them to a type of perspective that feels real to the way that world building creates a variety of personalities and a variety of conditions for art to be created. So first I'm going to draw my opus card. Here I have explain a local card game, write or perform a sermon, write a local idiom, describe or sketch the contents of a student's bag. Really like all of these. In fact, imagining what goes into a backpack at Thief and Liar School is um, a lot of fun. Writing or performing a sermon, a thief's sermon, would be really interesting to, to listen in on. I think all of these places could have really interesting local idioms. But honestly, the, the local card game is really speaking to me. I'm gonna go ahead and go with explain a local card game. And now I'm going to draw the flourish card and I have buy or involving a liar which feels a little bit on the nose for this setting in a radical style with a focus on metaphor or simile involving duress. If I was gonna do a local card game and I really like the idea of doing a card game on um Rogue Island because we already know that they gamble. We already know that there's this culture of play and gaming and manipulating. So I think a card game could be a lot of fun, especially something like Munchkin, a card game where like cheating is encouraged or it's in the rules. And then um, I'm very interested in the involving duress cue. And that's because I, I imagine that if you are a thief amongst thieves and you know that people are trying to get the upper hand on you, everyone's kind of playing their cards close to their chest. People probably aren't sharing a lot of information about themselves. Um, they're probably being very careful about not being too honest or putting their hearts out there in a way where they could get hurt or manipulated or letting information about their background leak out because that could lead to them being um, blackmailed. So the idea that a lot of them are also trying to do recon on each other and learn things about each other and get the upper hand is really interesting from a duress perspective. But I also don't like writing characters who are too manipulative and Rogue Island is already feeling like an irredeemable hive of cutthroats and I don't, I don't think I want to lean too far into that, as interesting as it is. But I'm really interested in with a focus on metaphor or simile. Number one, because I love working with metaphor and simile, and I think most writers do. Um, and number two, because deck worlds and story engine deck are about taking types of characters and locations and objects, looking for sort of the symbolic meaning of them, looking for interpretations of them in the way that you might with a metaphor or a simile. So I kind of like the idea that on Rogue Island, they have like a storytelling game. And this also helps like, I guess, re in my eyes, redeem them a little bit from being just a bunch of self-serving opportunistic cutthroats. Part of their philosophy or their, um, what they believe in is the idea that storytelling and persuasion are really powerful and important tools, not just for getting the upper hand, but just that they, they matter in and of themselves. And I'm imagining a card game where maybe there's just a series of like pictures on the cards or symbols, and then um, a hand of them is dealt out and all of the people in the game have to try and come up with um, interpretation or convincing story as to what this pattern of symbols or pictures means. So they're trying to create um, story craft from nothing. And the goal is to really do what rogues do and do what thieves do, which is to be persuasive and interesting and come up with a really compelling reading or interpretation of what the cards mean. I, I think that's a really interesting idea, how a liar would approach storytelling. And I've always, lo always loved that Neil Gaiman quote about um, fiction or stories are, are lies that tell the truth. And it also helps me understand the thieves a little bit more and not just have them be a bunch of self-serving um, sociopaths. So that's cool. I like this. I think to really ground it, I want to give this game a name, especially because there's so much emphasis on honesty and dishonesty in this group. I kind of like the idea that, that there might be competing names for how the game is interpreted. So the more cynical members of the island call it like the truth craft game or the truth duel game, um, where you're actually trying to create or fabricate truth. And that feels very true to how some rogues operate. Whereas for other rogues who fall more on like the bard side, where it's about like an interesting performance or persuasion or influence, um, I like the idea that they call it the storycraft game because they're, they're really much more into the power of narrative and the importance of stories and storytelling and how something that's false can feel true that way. And that could be an even like interesting philosophical dividing line between different participants in this program. The truthcraft or storycraft game, and you know from the way that someone talks about it, which version of the game they approach. I really like that idea. And I can imagine a really interesting scene where either a character in a novel who needs to get something out of one of the rogues makes a wager and then ends up 
having to go head to head in the storytelling game with the rogues, or where um, the, the party, if it's a role-playing game, where the party has to go in and do this social role-play scene or this social challenge where they have to try and figure out how to beat someone at this game. And you could really you know, take advantage both of in-game skills and then also player role-play to make that scene come to life and feel like it has really um, high stakes and, and vivid outcomes. So that's uh, an example of the Lore Fragments deck in action. If you have any questions for me about how this works or you want to give your first impressions or share some of the lore you've created, uh, the comment section below is a great place to sound off and share. I do check the comments and I love chatting with people. Also, if you like what you heard today or you found this helpful or interesting as a tool to use in your world building, I would love if you could do the YouTube cliche and do the like, comment, and subscribe. I know you hear about it all the time in every video, but really it does make a huge difference for teaching the Google robots that this is not just content coming out of a meat grinder, but actually something meaningful and useful that you would like to have it put in front of more people. And I am always really, really appreciative when I have a chance to put some of the resources that I've created in front of more creators, world builders, writers, storytellers, and teachers. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for giving me your time and attention and creative energy. I really hope you got something valuable out of this, and I look forward to saying hello to you in the next video. This is Peter in the edit booth once again, reminding you that if you love creating lore for your world, you can also check out our new standalone deck of lore prompts. Learn more at storyenginedeck.com slash lore.